What Linda and I found in our research is that meaningful work is important to everybody. Uh, it, we mm -hmm. used to perhaps think it was something only people who reached midlife cared about, but today younger people care deeply yeah. about having meaningful work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the work that we've been doing on intangible assets shows that meaningful work in terms of your capacity to build your intangible assets could be about, does this work help me to become more productive? Right. Your, brand, your, your branding question uh, and badging question. Secondly, does it help me to retain my vitality? And thirdly, and again, this comes back to the very interesting point that Tommy made about badging earlier, um, does it allow me to transform? Yes. A and we think and we hope that organizations are going to think less about the tangible asset part of the deal and more about the intangible asset deal, and, and which is primarily about meaning. Yeah. yeah. I think it's important as we talk about it, and, and Linda's examples really show this, that we're not necessarily using meaning in the kind of classic sense of save the world uh, kind of meaning. It can be meaning that is simply important, that it, as it says, builds your skills or puts you part of a community that makes you feel really good and invigorated. So we're using meaning in a little broader sense. Yeah, because I know that just straight after us, the CEO of Pizza Hut is, uh, you know, is going to talk about the wonderful, wonderful work that they're doing, about bringing meaning to, jo to a job which is serving somebody, but actually doing it in a way that people feel great about, yeah. great about you know, serving in a Pizza Hut. I think one of the things we'll see in the future is more and more companies that organize around projects. Imagine, if you would, that there would be almost a board of projects and I as an individual would be able to bid on any number of them that I found interesting for that year. Now, of course, doing that raises a whole series of questions about how are you going to, as a company, pre-qualify me to take on those projects? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think projects will be important, but I think that really at the core of the organization will be people who want to stay. And the reason that I feel that is quite a lot of high value work requires um, deep tacit knowledge of the organization. And I think that the challenge an organization will face will how to, how to balance people who are moving through on projects, who will know about the projects but not about the company, and people who actually have deep knowledge of the company. Now, actually, that can be a relatively small number. I remember speaking recently to uh, the head of one of the oil companies, and he said, actually, of the many hundreds of thousands of people they employ, a relatively small number have to stay in that organization because it's so important that they know each other and that they know the company. And I think the balance between who, who is the core and who's in the project. I think that each company will have to think very seriously about that topic. I, I completely agree with that. In fact, <laughs> funnily enough, I was asked to speak to a strategic planning gathering, uh, which is a little bit odd given my background. But as I thought about it, I argued that the most important strategic decision companies faced was just what you said, yeah. making that call. Yeah. between you know what they need in the core and what they yeah. uh, can better off tap on an as-needed basis. Now, tapping people, I think, frankly, is something we know how to do. Consultants, for example, work with lots of different companies. And we're very skilled in things like confidentiality and, and security of information and practices associated with that. So I don't have any concern about the idea that, that companies can put in place safeguards that will make them comfortable. One of the interesting things about uh, the 100 year life is we all have to carry on learning right the way through our life. And you know, the old way of thinking about that is to say, well, learning is always about a training budget. So how much money do we have? And how much do we have to spend? But actually what we're beginning to realize is that learning isn't necessarily about things you spend money on. And let me give you an example of that. You know, if you look at people's skill development, they uh, become more skilled, often because they move cross-functionally. You know, they move to a different job, which gives them a different insight, or they reshape their current job, so they learn more about it. That doesn't cost anything. It's about being mentored and coached. Uh, we are on our diagnostic about uh, 
you know, the, the development of intangible assets. 10,000 people have, have completed the diagnostic. And we've looked at age differences. And actually, there's remarkably little differences between different age groups on how they think about intangible assets, with a couple of, example, a couple of, a couple of exceptions. One is that younger people tend to be more focused at building their reputation. And the second is that older people seem to be more focused at how do you manage the stress and, uh, of work. So that's a perfect opportunity for mentoring across ages. Uh, and then thirdly, huge advances in technology, much of which is low cost, which really allows people either to work for a very short period of time, uh, you know, to learn something very quickly or to learn something over a period of time. So I think technology is really going to make a difference. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I want to emphasize the coaching, too. Yeah. I, I think uh, the role of first-line managers today, of managers today, with the people to whom uh, they're overseeing, is to teach. Because it used to be that the role of management was to judge, to assess, to critique. But today it's to teach. And that's where the real learning is going to come <laughs> in. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they already have made a robot that can make a bed. It's just very expensive and it takes a long time to make the bed. <laughs> uh, maybe beds will have to change before they make the robot. As we begin to think about this move toward spinning off, if you will, the number of employees, the kinds of ideas that Linda just spoke about of understanding who's absolutely essential to have as a full-time member of your organization and what skills, conversely, do you want to tap on an as-needed basis is really the first step. You've got to get it clear how that could work out. Uh, then you need to find a variety of people who have the kind of skills you might want to tap into and begin to develop relationships with them. I work with one company, a manufacturing firm, interestingly, that has over 60% of its workforce on a contingent basis. But they work very hard to maintain with re relationships with people with whom this contingent arrangement is in place. They stay in touch with them so that when it's time for those people to come in, they're going to be predisposed to come into this particular company. Hmm. So HR has to kind of shift its mental model from one of taking care of a fixed group of employees to one of managing a flexible pool of talent. Ten years ago, when I was thinking about technology and beginning to re research the book I wrote about technology called The Shift, I imagined that we would all want to live in fabulous places, you know, uh, Barcelona, up on the, up on the uh, mountains of Scotland. And actually, some of us did, uh, but most of us didn't. And that's really been a bit of a conundrum, actually, about mobility and work, because the truth is, even if... The standard, even, it's, even if it costs a lot to live in London or costs a lot to live in Berlin or New York, people want to live there. And why do they want to live there? Well, people have sort of realised that whilst it is, you can work at a distance from your, your company and you can use fantastic technologies to connect to them, the face-to-face -face connections and those, more importantly, those sort of random networking events turn out to be really important for skill development. So my feeling is that across a lifetime, people at some stage will want to be in a cluster with others, but maybe at other stages they'll, they'll move out and use uh, remote working. And you'll see a combination of both, but don't underestimate the power of face-to-face -face working. I, I agree with that as well. And one of the interesting things that we've seen in looking at really young people uh, people who are 13, 14, etc. cetera. Uh, now, granted, they may change their minds, mm -hmm. but many of them tell us they don't want to own a home. They'd prefer to rent. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it has to do with exactly what you're talking about, Linda, mm -hmm. this desire to be sometimes in the city and sometimes in the country, mm -hmm. and the flexibility that comes from not being tied to one physical mm -hmm. location. So I think we're going to see more people who are shall we say, a little nomadic hmm. in terms of how they approach their life.
you're a leader in a company and you want people to be innovative, first of all, saying be innovative <laughs> is about the worst thing you can do. <laughs> I think it actually freezes people. Linda, you've got a minute. Be innovative. You know, who can do that? And so the kinds of advice that uh, we found from our research, we did some research together mm -hmm. on collaboration, and we know, for example, from that research, what makes it easier for organizations to share information. And clearly sharing information is one thing that helps with innovation. So figure out how to make your organization more collaborative by wiring it for that kind of horizontal communication. We also know that discretionary effort, people wanting to do things, is really key. And again, Linda and I did some research on what makes for high levels of discretionary effort. And it has to do with deep digging into your own unique strengths. Hmm. A couple of other things that I really would recommend are make sure people have an open mind. So try to bust as many assumptions as you can, get people to think outside the box, and ask great questions. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think I just want to reinforce the great questions. You know, when, when we, we, we work together on collaboration, I then wrote a book called Hotspots. And remember that the, third, the first part is build a collaborative culture. The second is create, you know, great diverse networks. The third is have an ignition, yeah. which could be a question or a task. People actually are excited when they have an opportunity to work on something that they find challenging, meaningful. They can't write, they can't understand it, they're curious about it. Final thing I would say, and we know this very well as academics, is give people time. Give people time off. Uh, you know, it, you have to really sort of think hard before you innovate. And that thinking requires you to be uh, quiet. It requires quiet times, particularly innovation, it, the people who are introverted, they really need quiet downtime. So if you're in an office where everything's on all the time and you have very little opportunity to sit and think, you're not going to help those introverts really be innovative. 